This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Covered in Pet Hair, a boozy web show for pet lovers on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with the healing vet. I'll tell you all about him and introduce you as soon as we come back from these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with a doctor, a behaviorist, a dog trainer an animal communicator and author, a foodie, a visual artist, a musician, an Australian born and raised, dog dad to Pearl and Mitzi, cat dad to Parvati and Fred, the healing vet, Dr. Edward Bassenthwaite. Welcome, Dr. Edward. Yeah, it's good to be here. It's kind of early in the morning here in Australia. Yes, it's and it's uh, late in the evening right. over here. <laughs> yeah. Anybody participating in our drinking game today, anytime you hear this word, please take a drink of whatever you're enjoying. But remember, you have to be over 21 in the US, minimum age everywhere. So check with your local laws, always drink responsibly and never drink and drive, please. So I know you're not a drinker, Dr. Edward. So what are you having today? Well, I've got a cup of tea here because it's first thing in the morning to keep me company. That's fun because I also have a cup of tea today because I know you weren't drinking and we're talking about healing. So I chose a cup of chamomile because to me, like anytime I'm sick, anytime since I was a little baby, anytime anybody's sick at home, we do chamomile. So cheers to you. Thanks for being on the show again. And uh, I'm excited to dig into all of the expertise you have to share with us today. No worries. Awesome. Okay. So I always introduce this show with a game. And this is a very special game because I've used it once before on our premiere episode with Tim Link, who's an animal communicator. And I've never had a veterinarian on, on the show. You're the first veterinarian. And I wanted to dig into how woo woo you are. So this game is called woo woo would you or woo woo would you not? And it's actually my favorite game to play because it gives me so much insight into how open my guests are to alternative modalities. Are you ready okay. to play? Yeah. All right. So you just tell me if you woo woo would or woo woo would not use this modality or this approach for your pets. The first okay. one, the first one is pet Reiki. Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not? Yeah, I use, I use energy healing all the time with my animals. Okay, very good. Woo-woo would you or woo-woo would you not acupuncture for your pets? Absolutely. Acupuncture can be very, very beneficial. Awesome. Woo-woo would you or woo-woo would you not pet massage? Yeah, I do body work with my animals all the time. In fact, I teach body work and energy work for animals, so... Wonderful. And I'm not, I did not design these for you. This is something that the same questions I asked before. So it's just a coincidence that these are right up your alley, but they're about to get a little bit more out there. <laughs> All right. Next one. Walking pets in a stroller. Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not? Only if they were very old and, you know, so rickety that they couldn't walk and still needed enrichment. So in some, some situations, I think it can be a great idea. Yeah. Awesome. How about wearing your pets? Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not wear your pets? I don't think I would wear my pets, no. No? Okay. Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not use homeopathy for your pets? Yeah, I use homeopathy in my practice. I've seen some, some really good results with it. Awesome. How about herbal remedies? Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not? Well, absolutely, but I don't even think they should be woo-woo because they're awesome natural awesome. medicine. Very good. You know, that's it's you're so right. These are woo-woo for some people, but completely True. an everyday approach for others. How about cooking for your pets? Woo-woo would you or woo-woo would you not? I don't cook for my pets, no. No. But are your pets on a raw diet that you prepare? Uh, I get a pre-prepared one, so I, I get a frozen 
commercial one here in Australia called Raw Propose. No cooking, but maybe preparing. Um, defrosting and putting it in the bowl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't even know if that qualifies as preparing, but yes. Okay, how about leaving a TV on for your pet when you leave the house? Woo woo, would you or woo woo, would you not? I don't have a TV, so I can't. How about a radio? No, I don't leave a radio on for them. They don't need it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Last one, and I promise this is a real product that exists. I am not making this up. Woo woo would you or woo woo would you not prosthetic testicular implants for neutered pets? I would absolutely never do that. I think it's <laughs> just all kinds of ridiculous. That is all kinds of ridiculous. I love that. That's the perfect answer for that question. Well, thank you for uh, humoring me with that round of woo woo would you or woo woo would you not so dr edward you are the first veterinarian to be on my show so thank you but you're not your average veterinarian uh, can you describe how you're different from what most people take their pets to when they're sick well i'm i'm a holistic veterinarian which is there's not too many of us around there's there's a few of us scattered everywhere around the world and what that means is that i um, I try to use natural treatments. I try to avoid prescription drugs and surgery unless they're really necessary. And of course, if you're going to be um, really holistic, you've still got to be open to the allopathic medicine side of things because sometimes it really is needed and it is the best thing for animals. But um, so, and my, my sort of main focus is I've, created a, a healing and bodywork modality called the whole, whole energy body balance method, which um, I teach two different trainings. One is for body work and the other one is for energy healing. And that's really my main focus in terms of helping animals with silent pain, with trauma, with anxiety, and a whole lot of other stuff like that. Awesome. So you, I, I watched an interview you did um, a few years ago, and you said that your recommendation is for uh, pet parents to have both a traditional veterinarian, an allopathic veterinarian, and a holistic veterinarian on their pet care team. Is that right? And and can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. What, what I, so it's difficult with finding a holistic vet. If you don't have a holistic vet that lives in your area, you're going to need to have a relationship with a veterinary hospital because if your animal has an accident or has a sudden illness you're going to need to take them to the hospital right mm -hmm. but i think western medicine is very biased in and has a very narrow view of what medicine sh should be because there's a whole lot of um, influences from um, industry and what you might call scientific orthodoxy you know, for instance, I'm on a Facebook group for vets here in Australia. And if you post anything about anything alternative, they delete the posts. Wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of bias and prejudice against holistic and alternative medicine, even when there's some pretty damn good evidence to show that it can, can work. You know, I was looking into some research on energy healing lately, and there's some really good high grade, um, properly randomized, blinded studies that show that um, en energy healing can make a really significant difference to wound healing in mice. But scientific orthodoxy tends to ridicule even good evidence for this more alternative stuff, which is kind of annoying. So you are, you were trained as a traditional veterinarian and you found your way into holistic uh, approaches is that what happened and how did that, that go down yeah yeah, yeah. I, I grew up on a on a cattle property or a ranch for you guys where you live in north queensland in australia had a very conservative upbringing and when i graduated as a vet i was a very standard conservative regular type of vet um the first thing that happened was that i met a really beautiful innovative horse vet who worked on horses necks and he could take horses with the fall in lameness that they had nerve blocked and x-rayed and tried to find out what's going on multiple times, couldn't find any reason for it. He'd work on the horses next and the lameness would go away. 
Wow. So that's really got me fascinated. And I started thinking, well, what about dogs and cats? You know, they have necks. <laughs> they have spines. And we didn't get, I didn't get taught anything about that at university. So I just started getting my hands on animals and feeling deeper into their bodies. And I started finding a whole lot of pain and tension and dysfunction that I didn't know was there before I started looking for it. Then, so that was sort of my first step into more alternative stuff. And then about three or four years later, I got really, really unwell with chronic fatigue syndrome and was so unwell that I couldn't work for about two or three years at all. Had to go back home to the family farm and, and try to get well. And Western medicine was a help in the beginning for a few of the major issues like stomach ulcers and a few other things. And then it's like they ran out of answers and they ran out of ways to help me. So I started really looking everywhere I could for other ways to try and get my well myself well. And that's when I started coming across energy healing and a whole lot of other alternative stuff. I found it made a big difference for me. So then I started experimenting with bringing that into my practice as a veterinarian. And I found that the animals responded really well to it too. Wow, that's wonderful. And how long have you had your own practice where you uh, focus on these modalities? So the healing vet has been going for about eight years. Before that, for about seven years, I had another home visit practice called the Home Visit Vet in Townsville. And it's when I stepped into my own first home visit practice that I started to expand more and more into the, the holistic and alternative medicine because you know I didn't have the freedom to do that when I was working in hospitals because a lot of the people really weren't very open to it. Well it's interesting to me because you're in another country halfway around the world and it seems like Australia is just very similar in in, in, in the sense that they're not most people are not open to these alternatives and that still some of these things that we know work really well are still considered woo-woo or just not even an option that I was, I'm always hopeful to see that other countries are maybe more progressive in that sense. Well, Australia is actually one of the least progressive countries in a lot of ways around this stuff. Um, Interesting. You know, homeopathy in particular, there was a government um, review into homeopathy a while ago, which um, the first lot of results they didn't like, so they threw them all out and got a whole other panel of people that were very biased against homeopathy and they didn't consider a whole lot of evidence that's pro-homeopathy and, um, yeah, not good at all. But there's actually a lot of people who are interested in alternative and holistic medicine here in Australia. It's more the, the regulatory bodies and the government and the... Um, the Australian Veterinary Association and organizations like that that are very anti. Understood. And do you find that people, when they've exhausted, like you did, like you did, when they've exhausted the allopathic, the allopathic treatments, that's when they start looking into these alternatives? Sometimes, and you get other people that are that that's just what they want to do from, from the beginning. That's how they want to, um, that's their primary sort of philosophy in caring for their animals. So it depends. On the people but yeah I, I do get a reasonable number of people of animals with cancer that it's like what can you do to help palliate at least because they don't want to go down the route of chemo and sometimes they just don't have the money to go down the route of chemo because it's kind of super expensive absolutely absolutely and you have this whole method of helping animals that i'm going to dig into once we come back from these messages from our sponsors okay Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel Alvarez-Arada, and today I am speaking with the healing vet, Dr. Edward Bassenthwaite out of Melbourne, Australia. He is the one, a person that discovered and developed a healing modality that he now teaches to others around the world. So Dr. Edward, can you tell us about your specific modality that you use and have basically been the founder and developer of? It's called the whole energy body balance method. Um, it, it started off about 23 years ago, as I said, when Dr. Tom Ahern taught me about working on horses' necks. And ever since then, I've just, every animal I've seen, I've got my hands on them. And, and the animals that, that I've worked with have taught me all this, really. I haven't, um, when I started doing this, there were no trainings in any 
hands-on modalities for companion animals. Uh, there was no Bowen massage, myotherapy, uh, Emmet, or any of these other things that are now, you, you know, you've got immense possibilities to go out and learn hands-on ways to help your pets with, with body work and massage and, and touch, intentional touch. But in those days, there was nothing. So um, I started teaching it this about eight years ago I suppose and we went online about two years ago with the on, having all the trainings up online so the we have two flagship um, online trainings at the moment we have web body work for pets which is very much focused on the physical and one of the biggest things you learn in that is how to assess for silent pain so around about 53% of companion animals or pets have silent pain that their humans have no idea is there because they just don't show any signs of it. So, and you can't count on your vet to pick it up either, unfortunately, which doesn't mean they're bad vets. It just means they've never, most vets aren't even familiar with the concept of silent pain or neurofascial pain. And it's a particular hands-on skill to assess for it. It's easy to learn, but if you haven't learned it, you're not going to be able to do it. And the second training, which we've only just started mid last year for the first time is web energy work for animals, which is a high level training to use energy healing to help your animals, which I was just teaching on the weekend. And um, both of these trainings, you can learn just to look after your own pets, or you can become a certified practitioner and make a business out of it. And if you really love the work, we have uh, teacher training so that you can become a teacher to teach other practitioners. That's so cool. So I am familiar with craniosacral therapy that we use on humans. Mm -hmm. Is this something similar to craniosacral therapy? Uh, craniosacral therapy is one thing that we teach in the bodywork part of it. Um, so we, we teach some craniosacral techniques and skills, um, but what you learn in web body work is is a really broad range of hands-on skills from very light delicate touch through yeah. a really deep core release and mobilization of core structures of the body uh, you learn how to use movement and pulsing to open up restrictions and um, tension in the physical structures of the body so there's about 20 different skills that you learn in the training is the acronym WEBB Web? Is that what you call it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And can you give us some practical or an, I guess anecdotal um, improvements that you've seen? Um, just so I think most pet parents don't even know where they would begin to use something like this, but I'm sure it has everyday uses. Yeah. Look, I, I work with my animals. I um, do little bits all the time, and then I'll do uh, a longer session at other times. Um, in terms of animals I've worked with, you know, a couple come to mind. There was a, a lovely Shih Tzu cross called Dougie, who Dougie's groomer told his dad that she thought Dougie had body pain and he should come and see me. And Dougie's dad thought, this is a lot of nonsense, but he, 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 I'll go anyway because I love my dog. And um, when I got my hands on Dougie, he had a lot of pain in his body and his dad was kind of really upset to realize that his dog was in pain. He had none. So we did a series of treatments with Dougie and Dougie went from a dog that just sat on the couch and wasn't very engaged with life, had some really big changes in behavior. He um, became a lot more playful. Instead of just curling up on the back seat of the car, he'd be up looking out the window and, you know, really big changes as him. Another one was Benny, who's a 12-year-old ex-racing greyhound that I did a series of treatments with. Uh, he started playing with toys for the first time in his life. He went from a, a grumpy old man sitting on his bed and not wanting to have anything to do with people to a dog that was actively seeking a whole lot of attention and touch. And he also became the world's naughtiest puppy at the age of 12. He started doing, you know, tearing things up and getting in the bins and... <laughs> A whole lot of behaviors that they'd never seen in all the years they'd had him. Wow. And the third one would be Clyde, who was a, a, a staffy who came to me because he had severe separation anxiety. So he was literally 
tearing all the plasterboard off the walls when he was left alone at home. Very, very destructive. And after two weeks of a lot of, so there was a mother and two daughters in that family and they all did a lot of the somatic relaxation technique, which is a particular body work skill that causes a deep body level relaxation response. And after two weeks of that, um, Clyde was so relaxed that he wasn't even getting off his bed when his mum came home for a shift. They moved home about a month after that which is a stressful thing for a dog. And I think he chewed up one curtain and then was back to back to fine. So wow. very, very amazing response from him. So this is not just something for physical pain, but it can also help with anxiety. It's really good for anxiety and over arousal and behavior issues. So one of the big problems for dogs with humans is that humans love to razz up their dogs. They love to have an excited, crazy dog doing a lot of high impact, high arousal play. And it's not necessarily a good thing for a dog, a small amount of high arousal, high impact play each day, you know, 10 minutes or something like that is great. But if you've got your dog continually in a state of arousal, then their whole nervous system gets biased into and stuck into an aroused state when the natural state of a dog, um, you know, 95% of the time should be healthy relaxation. Wow. A lot, of dogs, a lot of dogs don't do that because, and also a lot of dogs have a whole lot of anxiety because they're very strongly affected by the human stress levels. And most humans have quite a bit of stress. So the body work, yes, can really, really help with anxiety, phobias, um, dogs that have had abuse and trauma, rescue dogs, that sort of thing, very, very much. Okay, so let's talk one, just to go deeper, just a little bit, mm -hmm. pun intended, I guess. So the body work, <laughs> you work with the fascia, is that right? Is that where yep. a lot of that tension is kept? Is that why it helps with the anxiety and the uh, stress? Well, it's, it's the neuro, what I call the neurofascial network. So the fascia is all the connective tissue in the body. It's um, everything that fascia gives everything in the body its shape and structure. It's like the scaffolding of all the organs on every dimension, right down to microscopic. And there's a lot of nervous tissue in the fascia. So there's a, a, a lot of sensory information that's coming from the fascia into the central nervous system the whole time. So the main cause of silent pain silent chronic pain is neurofascial pain. That's where, where it lives. And what, what happens is that um, every time you get a, a trauma in the body, like you'll get acute pain, but acute pain is really easy to see because there's a change, right? You get a change in behavior in animals with acute pain. Every time there's acute pain, bang, you'll see it straight away. But the chronic silent pain builds up really slowly over the years. And it builds up so slowly that there's no change in behavior that you can see as a human when you're living with the animal. And it's in the background, this chronic silent pain. There's no change in it. So there's no change in behavior often to be able to pick up what's going on. And would you agree that dogs, especially with chronic pain that comes on slowly, that they really, they're very resilient and they hide that pain to begin with. So it's even harder because they're dogs for us to recognize pain when it ha comes on so slowly? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a very, very deep survival instinct in all animals to hide pain. Because if you're out in the wild and you show weakness, everything that is going to say, oh, that's dinner. <laughs> there. You know, so there's a, and even in, in if we talk about dogs in, in a pack of wild dogs, sometimes if the, uh, one of the pack is sick or injured, all the other ones will turn on them and kill them. So there's this very, very deep survival instinct in our dogs and cats and, and, you know, bunnies or any other animal that's a domestic pet to hide pain, to not show weakness. And that's a problem for the humans because then you're not going to see any behavior often with chronic pain to let you know there's a problem. The only way to be sure is to learn how to assess for it hands on to palpate into the body, feel into the body, and be able to read your animal's responses to that touch. 
Awesome. And you, you've mentioned working with pets. What species do you include in this therapy? Um, well, the, the web body work for pets is for companion animals. So dogs, cats, and you could, you know, it could be bunnies and ferrets and chickens and um, chinchillas or any other small companion Chickens animal. too? Really? Chickens too? Yeah. I was thinking maybe just mammals, but wow, that's impressive. You could, you could work on reptiles with this as well. It, you know, they all have the same sort of basic thing with fascia in their body that you can work with. Very cool. So what else would you recommend apart from this? Do you usually give like a simultaneous supplementation uh, recommendation to go with your treatments? Look, the first thing I recommend to everyone who comes to me with an animal is to get their animal onto a fresh whole foods diet. It can be either raw or cooked. Um, but that's the first thing is to get away from processed foods. That can make a huge impact. The second thing that I recommend is to never ever revaccinate an animal without getting a teeter test first to check the antibody levels and see if it's a necessary vaccination or not. So for all that the um, veterinary industry screams out about, you know, we need an evidence base. All over the world, veterinary organisations are completely ignoring the evidence base on vaccination. So there's a guy called Dr. Ronald Schultz from the States who did a whole lot of research on, on vaccination and duration of immunity of vaccination and the modified live vaccines, the F3 and C3 for the core, three, core vaccinations for cats and dogs that we use these days give a long lasting immunity of at least five to seven years and often longer. And what's happening is that there are still millions and millions of animals every month getting yearly and three yearly so-called boosters, which is one of the most manipulative and flat out awful terms to use for what's going on because they're not boosters. If you're giving a vaccination to an animal that's already got high levels of antibody, the antibody latches onto the vaccine so the body can't respond to it. And all you're doing is giving an opportunity to, to have vaccination injury, which I see a hell of a lot of. Wow. Are there supplements that you think every pet should have? Supplements can be great. I mean, you guys in the States, if you want really good quality supplements, um, Dr. Peter DeVias has a fantastic line of, of supplements. I highly recommend his, his supplements. Unfortunately, we can't really get them here in Australia. Um, but otherwise... I'm not big on supplements. If you've got a healthy dog, there's not really much more need than a healthy diet, really. I mean, you can add in some omega, acid, omega fatty acids and you can add in a whole lot of stuff. Some dogs will do a bit better with them, some won't. Um, so it's a bit of a, you need to look into your own circumstances with that. Absolutely. But, so what um, can you tell me about the senior process, like the, at some point, all of us will see our dogs or our cats decline considerably their mobility affected severely by either a degenerative disease or just age and arthritis. Um, other than something like a therapy, like what you do, a modality where it's actual hands-on, um, is there anything else that might help? There's a lot of things that can help. And if you learn how to do body work for your pets and you do it consistently, you'll keep them they, you'll keep them younger for a lot longer. So my, my whippet's 14 years old now and she can still jump up on this table that I'm sitting at, the wow. massage table, Wow, which is pretty cool for a 14-year-old whippet. Um, two supplements that are really good for older animals, uh, maybe three even. One is green lipped muscle extract is a fantastic supplement to help um, slow down and reduce the pain and inflammation from arthritis. Uh, you better to start that earlier rather than later. Probably around six or seven is a good time to start that. So you're being a little bit proactive and getting in before you get that chronic inflammatory disease. Uh, golden paste can be really good as a, a natural anti-inflammatory. And the best medicine of all for old animals and probably just about any animal is CBD. So if you can get a whole plant extract of CBD organically grown, preferably grown outside under the sunlight, I mean, you have um, 
Charlotte's Web is a good brand in the States and Indibita is another good brand that's in the States as well. Um, but CBD is a really good medicine. It helps, it's fantastic for pain. It can really help uh, dogs with dementia too. I've had a few dogs respond amazingly well and have a big improvement in dementia symptoms on CBD. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. That's huge. Is there a way that you do virtual consultations for people who might just really respond to your message today and want to get in touch with you? Yeah, they can. Um, I do have some space for, for consultation. I, I'm so busy with the teaching stuff that I don't have a lot of space, but the, you might have to wait a little while to get in, but there is space for that. Um, you could contact us at the contact form at thehealingvet.com. And if I also have um, regular free webinars, which I'll give you some links to so you can put them in the comments and people can come along to the next ones if they want to. Wonderful. And if, if they come along to the webinars, there's a, like a 60% discount off the online trainings too if you attend the webinars. And where can somebody learn about your, t your trainings? Well, wholeenergybodybalance.com is the main core website. And coming along to the webinars is a really good place to start. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> then I have a whole masterclass on silent pain, on understanding, finding and treating silent pain for your pets. That is really, I mean, what a skill to have. If somebody were to get a puppy right now and start this class right now, yeah. they could really extend the quality of life of their pet. I, I'm, find, I'm finding this fascinating and um, I don't know anything about your programs or how much they cost, but I think that it's quite the investment. People spend a lot of money on other things. This might be something that is actually more beneficial than most options out there. Yeah. And look, we, we keep the programs affordable. If you compare it to um, your routine or emergency vet visits, it's definitely even the highest level packages are way less than your average emergency visit with a, with a real problem. Wow, that's wonderful to know. Well, I could really, truly talk to you all day and ask you questions all day, but I won't. I just want to wrap this up by thanking you for being a part of the show. Uh, here's to you for all of uh, your Thank contributions you. to the pet community. I also want to propose a toast to our executive producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible. To our listeners on Pet Life Radio and our viewers on YouTube, thanks so much for spending your time with us and learning from our experts here on Covered in Pet Hair. Here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Cheers. To learn more about Covered in Pet Hair, visit CoveredInPetHair.com or PetLifeRadio.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.